Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, this is joint work with my advisor, Emery Berger, um, and with some folks at UMass in uh, the linguistics department and uh, labor studies. So we have some breadth of uh, fields represented. So one of the things I want to go over actually um, at the beginning are some of the goals I have for this talk. Um, I'm not, I was really psyched when Tice asked me to come talk because he had contacted me before about uh, questionnaire languages and this is something I think is really important um, and I think that PL is underrepresented in a lot of the social sciences. Uh, and so I was super psyched um, and then I saw there was like this tweet and I'm not much of a user of social media so then I got really nervous because I was like, oh no, there's something on the internet and how to design surveys. And I'm not actually an expert in methodology, um, just to be clear. I'm a computer scientist. Um, so then I had this, like, because I have a, an overactive imagination and I'm a graduate student, um, I watch TV when I'm stressed out and I start to think that sometimes TV and reality are the same thing. So, you know, I watched Parks and Rec and I thought, um, you know, there's this character who became mayor of a town when he was 18 and then was invited back and totally shamed for running his town to the ground. And I was like, oh no, they're gonna think that I'm doing that for surveys. And I just wanna be clear, you know, I don't wanna, you know, step on anybody's toes. Really what I'm trying to get at here is that, you know, there may be some takeaways that you have from this talk, um, from things that we've learned um, and some approaches that you can use in writing your own surveys. Um, but really what I'm trying to do is convince you that surveys are a hard problem and they're a worthy topic for programming languages and software engineering research. Um, in particular, it would be great if more people worked in this area because it's just full of issues. It's a morass. Like there are so many, so many problems that are hard and interesting and I think that's a great topic for something like slash I. So I really hope that uh, you walk away being like, oh, I can do better. I can go into this field and make a difference. Um, and so at the end, I'd really like to discuss some of the insights uh, that we've developed over the past two years, which is when we originally published this work and when we had started the collaborations with uh, our social science uh, col uh, colleagues at UMass. So uh, I'm going to, nope, there's no water, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to start with a quick observation that we had. Um, one of the things that motivated this research was the realization that surveys are ubiquitous. Um, so if they're everywhere, then that must mean there's something important about them, right? I mean, we see them in industry uh, for things like customer, customer satisfaction surveys. There's a lot of research and a lot of money spent on this sort of thing. Uh, psychometrics, so things like, uh, you know, there's a depression questionnaire, which is extremely important for graduate students because clearly, like, this is something we need to measure. Um, clearly something that's very, very important in society in general. Uh, politics. So it was actually suggested to me that I swap in something about Trump, but I think this is a pretty appropriate question as is. It's about uh, longitudinal studies of you know, Russian attitudes towards Stalin. So make of that what you will, but people are very interested in you know, questions over time, public opinion research. And then finally, governments are also interested in measuring certain features of their populace. So this is the National Institute of Health, um, the health questionnaire. Um, that's about discussing attitudes towards things like alternative medicine. Um, this is uh, a, we'll get into this a little bit later, it's a particularly interesting um, example of a survey because it's one that is still done um, in person. So as an example of an in-person survey, I mean typically your workflow when designing surveys is to start out by building what's called the survey artifact. And this is critical because there's this pipeline. You have the artifact and then you have the results. And when we say survey, we're talking about this whole thing. But in fact, there are many pieces of this puzzle. So you start out by designing the questions and figuring out uh, you know, how they should be ordered, how, like, what they are in relation to each other. Um, and then you'll go and start asking people, you know, for, uh, go, and you'll go to, like, door to door or over mail or over text and start collecting results. Um, and then in the end, you get the results, you analyze them, you report them, do statistical analyses, et cetera. So this, this pipeline um, is a lot like writing your program um, and then running it once or maybe twice. So it's very easy right now to write a survey and then just deploy it. We have tools like uh, you know, SurveyMonkey and Qualtrics, and Qualtrics is a little, bit more, uh, a little bit more of a barrier because there's a paywall, but you know, I could write a Google survey right now if I wanted to and just start blogging about the results that I get back. And in fact, people do this all of the time. 
um more expensive surveys to run tend to have things like pilot studies, especially ones that have a high cost of social interaction, where if the survey ends up being ah problematic in some way um and it's very expensive to deploy, then you end up ah having this issue where you've spent a lot of money and you can't actually report on the results. so ah pilot studies exist for that purpose. but really when you're running a survey in general, you're only running it once or twice. Um, and then you analyze the results and report it to whomever um, you're reporting to. Uh, and the question we have is, is there anything missing from this pipeline? I mean, from a social scientist perspective. Um, so, sorry. Um, this is the world's most interesting coder. Uh, so it's a lot like writing your code once or twice and then just deploying it, you know? Um, this is kind of a problem. You know, we should really be applying some, you know, principles to this process. And in case, like, it seems like I'm being a little bit glib here with uh, the meme, um, I'm not. Like, this is still a huge issue in the social scientists, uh, social sciences. Uh, we really need to be building bridges between computer sciences and social sciences to bring, to actually have some sort of uh, exchange of ideas because a lot of things in the world are uh, influenced by the social sciences, the policies that end up trickling down to us. Um, and it may be kind of surprising, at least it was to me, um, two days ago, there was uh, a blog post on Andrew Gelman's blog. He is a statistician, a very famous statistician, who writes regularly for the Washington Post, and he blogs pretty regularly. And someone had written in saying that, you know, research isn't reproducible if it only runs on your laptop. And what's critical about this is that Gelman frequently writes about issues such as p-value hacking, that's one thing people call it, or like coming up with many hypotheses on a single data set and being influenced by, uh, you're basically querying the same thing many times and then you end up getting uh, spurious results. So what's interesting is that someone wrote in and was basically like, we need to be able to ship our experiments. And what's really interesting about this particular um, person writing in was that there's this, there's a bit down here um, where he talks about how when people ask him to rerun analyses or like drop an experimental condition or you know incorporate some additional information, he talks about this dread that he feels that like not only is it going to take a lot of work to uh, change the scripts that he's written, but he's not even sure it'll work. Uh, because at any given point in time, the question is like, oh my goodness, is there something that I didn't account for or is there something that's uh, you know, slipping into the system that I did by hand, that sort of thing. And so, just the idea of even running with make files, he talks about, is just not something that is pervasive in the community. And we take this for granted. So, when we work with social scientists, we really need to keep in mind that uh, there's a huge cultural difference. Um, and so, we need to, you know, work on bridging that gap. Um, so, when we talk about taking the approach that surveys are programs, uh, we need to realize that there's this barrier that we need to permeate. So as computer scientists, we recognize things like the flow through the survey itself. If you, you, know, you ask somebody a question and they're in a particular demographic, you might ask them one set of questions and if they're another demographic, you might ask them another. Um, so for example, like on the National Institutes of Health one, um, if you're female, they'll ask about your reproductive history. If you're male, not so much. Um, <laughs> but for uh, us, it's very obvious what this is. But for social scientists, it might not be as obvious. Um, and then we have things like static checks. We clearly re recognize that you know questions can have various types, and there are certain things that we can look at. A, you know, we can look at a particular piece of code or a program, and say, hey, there's some stuff that we can figure out just from looking at this text alone. Um, and then when we run things, we recognize that you know a runtime system matters and it provides the semantics for the program in question. And so we can also run dynamic checks to verify that what's happening is what we expect to happen. But this is not necessarily how a social scientist views the world. And so when working with social scientists, we need to really think about domain-specific abstractions that speak to the things that they understand and to integrate with existing tools. Uh, we get, so we have a uh, computational social science institute at UMass. And as computer scientists, we get emails from them all the time offering things like training in SPSS and Stata and all of these tools that are proprietary and like we as computer scientists never touch. You know, we see things like R and we just pick them up and we start coding in them and then we complain about them and then we provide fixes and we provide other languages and this is just not how it's done other, like in, in other fields. So 
Uh, yeah, so basically we need to look at what they're already using and how they already think and figure out how to fit it in with the pipeline. Because when you're working in a world where it's not even clear that you can rerun analyses, uh, this kind of thing is really important because people are just not going to do it otherwise. Um, and that brings us to the last point, which is it really needs to be e easy to use. So we need to be taking cues from the general process that people, people uh, uh, use. So at this point, you may be wondering, you know, haven't we done this already? Um, aren't there already examples of survey languages or you know, questionnaire languages? And the answer is yes. Um, so this is an example of Topsil. Um, it's a programming language uh, for uh, questionnaires that's embedded in Scheme. And it's quite a few years old now. Uh, it was part of a dissertation on DSLs, Im uh, embedded DSLs, and its primary concern is making sure that you get through the survey, um, you know, beginning to end, and there aren't any loops, and that it renders correctly, and all this other stuff that's really important for, like, reasoning about the execution, and about the GUI in, in particular. Uh, the primary example of Topsil was a collaboration with uh, a social scientist, um, but today I had previously tried downloading it, and I couldn't get to run, um, probably because, you know, it was for Scheme and, you know, it's many generations since, you know, 2003 or so when this was published. Um, so there was an attempt. Um, there's also uh, QL, which, you know, people here have worked on. It's, uh, my understanding of it is it's a specification that has been used to benchmark uh, language workbenches. Um, again, focusing on rendering the program and making sure that execution, for example, in the browser runs correctly. Uh, and then we have things like, this is uh, called QBL, and it uh, is an XML-based language from a statistician from uh, Australia. And then uh, what you're seeing right now is actually the editor, on, uh, the editor that's built on top of the uh, XML format um, called Canard. And the idea here is that this particular statistician wanted a way of shipping his code and rerunning his surveys. Um, and editing them. And so he came up with you know, a, a serialization and provided tools on top of that serialization. And then we also have things like uh, Blaze and QPL, which is, are you know, very similar to, it, like in the line of things like Stata and FPSS. They're declarative, um, and they, both of these, I believe, hook up to analyses in the end, but they don't necessarily have a notion of things like debugging or a runtime system or anything like that. Um, and you, a lot of the survey uh, languages are like this, are built for things like running, uh, you know, your, your National Institutes of Health sort of survey. Like there are languages that don't look like languages because they're meant to be executed by people in real time, not like your program's runtime. So uh, the missing connection with all of these other attempts, which are great, I mean, it's great to know that's going to execute well in your browser, it's just that there's, uh, not this necessarily this connection between wrong conclusions and bugs in the program. Um, and that's really what we hope to provide here. You know, we're really hoping that the, the ideas that we're presenting to you today are things that you could incorporate into any one of these languages. Um, they're orthogonal to the languages themselves. So that's what SurveyMan is about. Um, clearly, we've also built a syntax on top of this. Um, and we were wanted to have, uh, you know, the, the comfort of uh, social scientists' familiarity in mind. And so one of the things that we wanted was a familiar representation for non-coders. Uh, because we can't necessarily assume that they're going to be coding, know how to code in the first place. Um, the next thing we wanted was some sort of readable and distributable representation. Because ideally, you would be able to publish uh, your survey you know, in the appendix of the paper that you've submitted somewhere so that someone else could execute it. Uh, you know, obviously, we've been engaging in this sort of thing in our community recently with things like artifact evaluation. And this is something that the social science community is very interested in also reproducing. Um, and so but we also want to make sure that people can, at first glance, you know, spot what the questions are, for example, to be able to get a quick go do a quick pass of the, the program that they're looking at and get some kind of understanding of what's going on. And this is not possible in, you know, data seri in, in serialized formats. And then finally, we want to make sure that we have the appropriate abstractions to represent the kinds of things that social scientists want to do and need to represent, uh, need to present. Um, so SurveyMan is also working towards some sort of semantics of these programs, um, which is kind of odd because uh, there are certain challenges that uh, we face in having a, a 
program that's meant to be run ah partially on people, partially offline, that sort of thing. so we want to make sure that any notion of correctness that we have um also considers the responses. because it's not just about executing in in your browser and making sure that you step through each of the you know questions in in the program and that you know you have reachability and things like that. but we also need to make sure that the responses that you get back are you know what you might expect you know given you know your background knowledge or that you know they're not totally biased in some way. um and we also want to make sure that the runtime includes people. so you have this process where as i said before you have the artifact, the program that gets fed into the, the program part um and then we have a runtime. things like when you actually whether you're walking to somebody's house or you have some program that's deploying you know uh you know uh questionnaires on twitter or you're running on mechanical turk that kind of thing uh you need to incorporate knowledge that you have about human behavior. um <coughs> and then in the end you the, the analysis that you get the correctness of the program is entirely really should be determined by the responses themselves. And so we need to be able to connect uh the statistical biases you'll see in the results set um with the notion of bugs, you know, in your program or the runtime system. So, uh this was our attempt, our first attempt at Serverman. Um so this may not look like a language to you guys. It's a kind of tabular programming language. Um we chose this format because our collaborators were already encoding uh their surveys in excel and the reason for this was that they were deploying on some other services and they needed to do some data transformations and they already knew how to do the transformations in excel so they just loaded it up there um it was actually pretty impressive so what we wanted to be able to do was take what they already had and provide some sort of like small transformation on it and have that as input to our uh system so all we really required of them was that they be able to uh mark one column as a question column and another column as an options column and the only really like syntactic thing that we're enforcing here is that uh the options have some sort of ordering that's uh attached to the questions so the options themselves you know if they're randomized then they can uh be swapped between each other but they have to be uh in a block with the question Um, and then we had other semantic other columns that are semantically important that we'll get to later that represent some of the abstractions for some of the more complex features that people want in surveys. But in general what we really want to be able to do is just ignore everything that isn't one of these special columns, pipe it through to the end and provide some automated analyses on the integrity of the artifact that they've provided us. So that brings us to Serverman's focus. So I uh, we want to be able to run um many times and we we are in this sort of era of big data um and as we we're, we're trying to figure out what the workflow should be uh we've actually looked to things like machine learning because they've dealt with things like crowdsourcing systems in the past so it's not super important that you understand the details of this uh but this is a uh model for estimating um classes for input and uh basically the integrity of a particular user because we have this problem where if you're on a crowdsourcing system and you're for example asking people to provide labels for something um for example like uh something like language classification just to say is this language this language or another language uh you know you some people are going to be good at that and some people are not going to be good at that and some tasks are going to be hard and some tasks are not going to be hard and because there's this variation in both people and the task uh you need to be able to model both of them uh because you could have good workers uh be provided a bad task or a bad a task that's not suited to them. So, uh that's what this is generally modeling and in particular uh the contribution of this model was that they were trying to figure out how many uh gold standard questions you need to have in order to uh ground your the 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 um uh results that you get in the end to bound the results you get in the end. So, I brought this up because um we we have a lot of in machine learning there's this idea of curated data and having you know a training set for supervised learning and then being able to infer labels later um and then in crowdsourcing we're really trying to estimate something about uh the population and like whether or not they're able to judge that data um and this paper was really introducing a notion of a sp very specific notion of quality control having to do with these uh this known data ahead of time so uh where does something like a survey fit in uh in this world you know in this case when talking about things like labels for a particular piece of input 
the survey itself would just be the collection of data items. and that's what this is highlighting. but for us, you know there's there's this weird question because we're dealing with a kind of different domain from what machine learning is looking at. so in particular, surveys a lot of times are about you know opinion research. so how can you extend the things that we've learned from machine learning to something a domain that's a lot less constrained? Um, so you know the thing that we really focus on here um, is what's called measurement bias. so opinion research um, falls within a field of social science research that is related to things like causality. and there are three main types of bias in this world that can affect uh, the results that you get at the end. and our focus on measurement bias is really about the artifact itself, things that you can look at statically. so for example, you might have something like a lack of specificity. so everybody in you know i'm assuming remembers from school learning about significant figures. Um, so if you have a ruler and it's you know poorly marked, there's only so much you can you know tell about a particular measurement because of the lack of specificity in the you know the, the measurement itself. Um, there's actually well, one of my colleagues told me a story that was really interesting about another type of uh, measurement bias relating to ceiling and floor effects, which is uh, if you're if you're running a class and you do a test, you don't want the test to be too hard or too easy because it ends up pulling people in either direction, and it doesn't give you uh, a good sense of how people are doing. You want it to be just right because you want to be able to measure smaller differences between people to figure out how you're teaching and whether or not the concepts you're teaching uh, are actually getting through to people. So if you have something that's too easy, you don't know, and if you have something that's too hard, you also don't know. And so these are pulling in directions that are uh, basically not measurable. Like you can't actually come up with any conclusions from them. Um, and then there are also issues with compound questions. You know, we assume that a particular question has only one concept attached to it, but it's quite possible, and often people ask these questions that have many different pieces to them. And it's difficult to analyze something when it actually ends up representing something like a joint distribution. Even the survey structure itself, like these are all the first three are about specific questions. Um, whereas this fourth one is really talking about the entire artifact. Um, so it, the entire artifact, we're arguing, can also cause biases. And so the other biases that we want to just like briefly mention, uh, a lot of work has been done in this area, are things like sampling bias. So deciding what percentage of the population you're going to try to contact. Um, this is a very deep issue, and there's tons and tons of research and like years of research on this. Um, in particular, like there are issues with using things like Mechanical Turk because you don't actually get what's known as a probability uh, sample, where you're not actually, you, know, you don't have a full view of the population, and you're not deciding uh, whom to to pull in. Um, you get instead what's called a convenience sample, and you need to correct for some of these things. We don't deal with this. It is a pervasive problem, um, and there's some really excellent work on this from the guy I mentioned earlier, Andrew Gelman, um, and one of his collaborators. Um, on making certain corrections for things like polling. Um, and the other thing is actually confounders. Um, so trying to figure out whether or not you have enough information to actually make some sort of conclusion and it's not being influenced by something outside. So it might be that you think that one uh, hypothesis is connected to you know, a particular conclusion, uh, but there might be some piece of data that you're not modeling. Um, so right now we don't deal with that. Um, we just wanted to focus that because these are the this is you know essentially a complete representation of the major issues when it comes to bias in uh, you know, opinion research. We were really focusing on measurement bias because this is really the thing that we can constrain to the artifact itself and we can look at statically. So uh, that's cool. Um, why should you believe me? Uh, well, there's actually plenty of work that says that design matters. So uh, there's an institute at the University of Michigan that has a bunch of people who do survey research, and they've spent a lot of time uh, actually running these things and trying to get feedback from people on you know, what works. And there are a lot of heuristics, and some things have been empirically tested. But essentially, like people know that design matters, but it's hard to quantify. Um, we also know that having uh, you know, both surveys on the web and humans involved in the loop, you need to have this stuff in mind when you're developing systems, that you have people involved in them, and that you know, the particular way that you lay out a survey, for example, could affect the results that you have in the end. So again, this is about looking at the static version of the survey and figuring out whether or not that's having some undue influence on the results. So I'm just saying that this is something that uh, like I didn't come up with or anything. This is just well known, I think, in, in the field. So 
focusing on SurveyMan in particular, we want to like think about some motivating questions. Um, so what kind of bugs uh, do we see in surveys in general? And how can we use a DSL to prevent or detect these bugs? So going back to the world's most interesting coder, um, we know that we can have kind of bad responses from you know, random respondents, for example, or lazy respondents. Um, but there are also, and that's something that happens later on down the pipeline, but the structural issues we're talking about are things like wording bias, um, break off, things that in your survey that can cause people to leave, um, order bias, so the way that a uh, particular survey, the structure of it, it influences other questions, um, yeah, more related to respondents, and this can cause your results to be invalid. So how can we control for those things? So going back to the workflow, uh, you know, first of all, we present things, we, uh, you write your survey using SurveyMan, um, and you'll run it on some sort of electronic system, such as Mechanical Turk, and we'd like to be able to have a, a loop where you can run something in Mechanical Turk, get some data back, run some analyses on it, see if there are any issues, fix them, and run them again. This is very difficult to do uh, in real life, essentially. So um, program bugs. Um, you would, so, it, okay, uh, there's some stuff later on whether or not you actually do this, but the idea originally was because Mechanical Turk allegedly has half a million users, that you would be able to run a small version of the study to get a, uh, some sort of sense of what the statistical properties of the survey are, whether or not there are any bugs, that sort of thing, um, fix them, and then run it for real. I mean, you could run it for real on Mechanical Turk, you could run it for real elsewhere, you know, a lot of other systems don't, pr I mean, uh, I don't pay for Qualtrics, so I don't necessarily know, but I'm not sure that other systems provide like a debugging service um, for your survey. I think you're kind of left alone um, in your own training to deal with that. So uh, if you chose to run it, for example, using one of those services, you might run a pilot study on Mechanical Turk. It's, yeah, so I mean, I'll get a little bit more into some issues with Mechanical Turk later, but uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, so, question order bias. Um, so, has everybody heard of this? Yep, yeah, yeah, okay. So, this is always a weird one because it's not always obvious when you see it. Um, with some things, it's obvious after the fact, but uh, it's also not always obvious what it means. So, here's an example from Pew. Uh, this question that they asked after Obama was elected in 2008, whether Republican leaders should work with Obama, obstruct Obama, or people don't know. Um, and so, 86% said, oh, sorry, 66% said that uh, you know they should work with him. And then they asked this question about Democratic leaders um, if they should work with Republicans after you know this shift in the political parties in the U.S. Um, when they asked the question about Democratic leaders first, they got a different result. And then when they followed that up with Republican leaders, uh, clearly they got a pretty significant shift in the percentage of people who said that they should people should work with Obama. Um, so it's not always entirely clear what the priming effects are. Um, not entirely sure like why this is the case. It's just something that we see. And I, I think this is a particularly interesting one because uh, previously we had uh, this example of like uh, civil unions versus gay marriage. And it's very well established that if you ask about uh, civil unions first, there's this anchoring effect that happens that causes people to like become more comfortable with the idea, et cetera. Um, but for this, it's not really clear what it means. We just know that it, it's there. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about is wording bias. This is another structural issue in the survey. Um, so this is another example from Pew asking about uh, military action against Saddam Hussein. And when they just asked the question like this, 68% were in favor. But when they qualified it with uh, casualties, and mind you, this is before the whole drone thing, so like it should be fairly obvious that this is logically follows from going to war. 43% um, of people were in favor of it. Um, so, yeah, uh, clearly a problem. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we've done some preliminary work uh, looking into various transformations you can make on questions and the impact they have. It's really hard to quantify. So here, clearly, like, 
this is, you could split this up into two questions, right? Um, and make it so that you have two, because one of the things I brought up before was that uh, you can have compound questions that really make the, uh, can make the responses not an accurate reflection of the thing that you think you're asking. Um, so you could split this up to try to isolate each piece of the question. Uh, but when people are writing, they're usually only writing like one version of each question each time. Um, so the workflow that we've talked about is one where when writing this, you may be influenced by something you think is important about uh, you know, the effects of going to war, and you think that it's equivalent to asking about going to war. Um, but because you have your own biases that play into uh, the authorship of the survey, um, without interrogation, it's not clear that that would ever come up. So, um, yeah. So the next thing we look at is abandonment. So um, examples of either offensive, uh, confusing, or problematic questions. So lots of things fall into this category. One of the biggest problems is actually confusing questions because people get fatigued and they leave. Um, the question I'm about to show you is from Roper uh, as an example of a conf uh, uh, both offensive and confusing question. So they ask this question, does it seem possible, like basically to you know, deny the Holocaust? Uh, and it turns out this question was a yes or no question, which makes it even worse. It's just like, what are they asking? What does it mean if you answer yes? What does it mean if you answer no? Oh my goodness, what are people going to like? Oh, I just don't know what's happening right now. I need to like leave the survey immediately. So this is a problem. Um, but there's also this other problem of overly long surveys, which lead to abandonment. Um, so lots of questions, there's a lot of work in this area that, works, that looks at things like splitting up surveys and trying to ask people questions separately and then combine the answers in the end. The problem is that you need to know a lot about the population to do that because you need to interpolate the answers. So not a lot of people have this luxury. Like if you're Google, you can do it. But if you're an academic researcher, it's not clear that you can do this. Um, so the National Institutes of Health survey, um, clearly the government has lots of resources, but what's interesting about this is it's 20 pages long. So for example, if you try to do this online, you would have a problem where uh, you know, the barrier to quitting is very low, and it's not clear that you would get the results that you want. But surveys don't actually even need to be that long. Um, so this is an email, I just thought it was like, kind of cute to put up here, like the CRA does you know, grad student questionnaires, and uh, you know, I feel like I fill out one of these once every six months or something, and I always, like, they're not that bad, they're fine, I just go to fill them out, and I'm like, this just feels like it takes so long. Uh, and because you know, clearly I've done some work in this area, I tough it out and I you know, finish my survey, but I imagine there are a lot of grad students that don't. So you know, anything that's distracting um, can be a huge impediment to actually completing the work. Um, so these are, these are major problems. But at least they're problems that you can control. Um, bugs in deployment are a little bit different. So you know, if you're running on Mechanical Turk, you have this problem where there are all these people who actually do surveys as their primary source of income. Like there's a whole pool of people who just do surveys. Um, they, there was actually a statement that we found, uh, a, a comment that was on like NPR about a guy who said that he does surveys because it's easy to spot the questions that are meant to identify you, um, like as you know, a bad actor essentially. And uh, because surveys don't have right answers, it doesn't really matter. You can basically like have a very low level of attention um, and just keep like clicking through. Uh, then we also have this problem of you know, bots, which has uh, dissipated somewhat in the past couple of years because Mechanical Turk has um, added features that allow you to prevent um, you know, bad actors and report bad actors. But just because Mechanical Turk has figured out a way of handling this doesn't mean the next crowdsourcing system is going to uh, be able to figure it out. The other thing is that um, after talking to someone, a statistician um, who had done work with, I've done a lot of work on a uh, crowdsourcing data set, he was saying that uh, there's a huge problem when acquiring these data sets from other firms because even though most people are okay, um, you get a few bad actors that end up providing a large portion of, you know, for example, labels that are just wrong. And there was an excellent paper a couple of years ago at USENIX about, uh, it's like called Man versus Machine, about this problem of like how much taint does it take to co totally overpower a data set. So it's something that we know happens. And even if it doesn't happen at a high rate, the cost is very high. And of course, the cost is that the results become invalid. 
Um, so, oh, that went a little too quickly. So the question was, how do you prevent and or diagnose some of these bugs? Um, so order bias, basically they're kind of all going to be the, the same. Um, these two questions are about uh, whether, whether Republican leaders should uh, work with, uh, each side should work with the other. Um, the idea is that you need to be able to randomize the order of the questions. So uh, this is actually the wrong one, but uh, there's this question of, uh, here's a different example of order bias, how often do you vote versus uh, military action in Iraq, which is related to the uh, <coughs> uh, wording bias question. Basically, you want to be able to randomize the order of these two things. Because if you believe that one thing has an influence on the other, um, or vice versa, if you randomize the order, you end up combining the two distributions. And unless you end up seeing some sort of peaked situation where there really are like two separate distributions of these things, um, you're going to be like, just combine the answers. Um, because it's quite possible that you'll end up having a certain amount of noise in each distribution. And that noise could be the thing that causes you to misidentify an effect. Um, so clearly, you have some set of questions, A through D. Um, and we want to be able to randomize these, uh, the order of them. And this is sort of the default uh, setting in SurveyMan. And the way we detect it is we'll ask a first question, and we start tabulating the results. So this dude answers always for the first thing. This is the, like over here on the left. Question A precedes question B. And this is the case where question B precedes question A. Um, we get another person who comes along. And we continue to tabulate under each of these conditions. And then we look at the distribution of results. Um, and we use the chi-squared statistic for this particular case because it's discrete data. And we just look at whether or not the two distributions uh, you, uh, are different from each other. Um, and then for wording bias, we want to be able to do essentially the same thing. Like, how, how do we get rid of this? We end up having a construct in our language that allows us to sample from different groups of questions. So the idea here um, is that we have two sets of two questions here that are supposed to be equivalent to each other. Um, and so the way we do this is we have these extra columns uh, that we've added. This is to goes back to the semantics. The, what, what are the abstractions that our uh, users need to represent the things that they want to be testing? So uh, there's this idea of grouping questions together that are similar to each other. Um, that we that we were uh, told about from our, our collaborators in linguistics, um, and so they might have a particular concept where they're trying to figure out like ask some question if for them it was some question about like uh, whether or not something is an English word, and they might have another like block this is what they're called um, that asks about demographics, and so the one thing was the thing they were primarily interested, and the other block was something else that they were did they were interested in collecting, but they were conceptually very different from each other, so they wanted to be able to group these things together. And so we provided a mechanism for this. Um, they were also very interested in uh, certain ordering constraints. So they wanted to make sure that certain questions uh, appeared, for example, within a certain distance of each other or didn't appear together. And so we wanted to be able to provide them with some sort of structure for nesting these things. So what you're seeing here is uh, one of these sub-block situations where there's a whole survey. And that's the one that's on the outside here. And then you have another block on the inside, and that's what this A1 is. And the A1 thing, the A is just, you know, you have a marker that precedes anything that's not alphanumeric, or that dot um, that tells you that you're allowed to move this block within its container. So this actually allows, like, fairly complex um, ordering uh, semantics for the program, um, especially when you combine it with this branch, this notion of branching. So we have two different separate notions of branching. One is a true branch, and the other one is really we used to denote sampling. And for the sampling case, we treat the question as if it were a single question. And that's what you're seeing here. So basically, we put these two questions that are supposed to be similar to each other into a single container, and we mark that container as something that you just basically have to pull the next question at runtime. That's what the next is. It's defer my next question until you know, I hear from, back from the random number generator what should come next. Um, so <coughs> for blocking, uh, you know, the default setting in SurveyMan is to have all top-level questions and for them all to be randomized. And then uh, by adding in this block column, users can put uh, questions into different blocks. And so here we have questions A and B are in a block and questions X and Y are in blocks. Um, and then for branching, um, we have, uh, within a particular block, it has a branch target associated with it. So the idea, our general idea, is that every person, if they don't leave the survey, should see essentially the same survey. Um, so what this means is that if you have some block 
that has branching in it, you have a particular branch question um, that's marked as such. And it'll have, for each of its responses, branch targets. And then when the questions are randomized, uh, the branch question can move up and down, but you have to execute everything within the block before moving on to the next one. Um, so what you're just seeing here is that the, a uh, association between a particular question and a block, this branching notion, um, is attached to the block, not the question. Um, so then for sampling, the interaction between these two things, again, you might, you're going to basically select any one of these questions, and again, you end up having the branching associated with the block itself, not the question itself. So for wording bias, we walk through the same process as before. Uh, we count all these things, and you know, it's essentially the same. For break off and abandonment, this one's a little bit more interesting because uh, as we're counting whether or not you have, uh, whether or not you see break off, one of the problems that we run into is that unlike the other case where uh, each person is going to be in each condition um, with equal probability, um, and the light, the, these two instances are independent of each other, the problem is that breakoff is not something that is independent per position or per question. So the longer you're in the program, uh, sorry, the longer you're executing, the, long, the longer that you're taking the survey, um, at each point in the survey, uh, whether or not you leave is something that is cumulative. So whether or not a breakoff is significant is something that uh, is actually a little bit mm, sophisticated to figure out. Um, so we currently just report uh, whether or not, like what the breakoff statistics are, what the total uh, distribution of breakoff is, um, and not necessarily whether or not it's significant. Oh, so uh, and then we had, oh, uh, yeah, so the survey too long. So this is the per order. And then this one over here is per question. So you can see the difference between questions and order and detect whether or not uh, each of these things has an influence. Like you can isolate the influence of each of them. And finally, for bad actors, um, we have a series of uh, classifiers that we can use that really uh, essentially are trying to uh, identify sparsity. So what's interesting about surveys is that uh, you know, as you get a bigger and bigger survey, really the, the, the approach that we're taking is that it would be great if you could get everybody to cluster together, everybody who's good to cluster together in a particular group. Um, and then pipe them through the classifier and select out the uh, bad actors and then only be left with the good actors. Um, so one of the things that, uh, we we'll can actually get into some of the problems with um, like some of the approach and using Mechanical Turk um, is that Mechanical Turk is actually a limited resource. <coughs> so um, despite the fact that they allegedly have half a million people participating, um, at any given time, uh, there was a study last year that said essentially there were only about 7,300 um, workers at a time. And when you do studies that are between 100 or 1,000 people, uh, you very quickly exhaust this pool. And apparently it takes about seven months to uh, get turnover in the field. And so these were some graphs from the paper, uh, this paper that's cited here, about uh, different labs, looking at the identifiers for the respondents in each lab. And so the reason why I bring this up is that uh, there's this question when it comes to correctness uh, that's related to the result that you have in the end. Is there a way that you can figure out some, of, like, some things that you would normally do in a pilot study statically? Um, and in particular, like how many people do I need, uh, given that I you know, don't have an infinite pool? And this is really just some power analysis stuff, but it's really, what's different about it is that uh, a lot of current research in, in surveys is really looking at the survey as a whole and looking at like treating it as a, an entire, pe uh, an entire um, entity. And one of the things we're doing is we're breaking up into pieces and asking a bunch of questions about these. We really want to know whether or not the structure of the survey has an influence on the results you get in the end. And the way that we handle this is we run simulation. So if you run the static analyses on the survey, um, it'll run, you know, we have uh, various profiles of users that it will run to try to figure out if, uh, what the bounds are on uh, detecting bad actors given certain proportions of the population. So two years later, um, how did we do? So in terms of language syntax, uh, we made this question about familiar representation uh, to coders and whether or not you can pass this stuff off to somebody else. Um, turns out social scientists are not a heterogeneous population. So even though the, uh, the Excel worksheet model was um, very familiar uh, to our original set of users, it turns out that it's not super popular with some other users. 
Um, so we started porting this over to a GUI, our GSOC student in 2015, um, Prakar Srivasta, um, <coughs> had come up with, uh, he implemented like a blocks version of the survey that had a bunch of uh, drag and drop features uh, that would allow people to use a somewhat more familiar interface but would export this, uh, the data um, in the format that we, we, we needed in the end. Um, it's not currently feature complete. The branching uh, visualization has not been uh, totally figured out, but there's definitely you know, work there. I think that some interesting questions about how to get people to efficiently design surveys and interfaces for survey design that you know, I, I think is fairly untapped. Um, in terms of appropriate abstractions, uh, we were able to express a variety of fairly complex surveys that were provided to us, and so we're fairly happy, but the main problem is that some of these abstractions are a little too low level. So the issue of placing things into blocks and the relationship between which blocks are randomized and which aren't uh, is confusing to new uh, survey designers. So we're trying to figure out another way of representing this that would make more sense uh, to the, the end users. Um, and then finally, coming up with uh, you know, an appropriate semantics for what it means to be a survey, a survey that you're executing. Um, you know, we want to, you know, this is from Jurassic Park, there's like a famous scene with Jeff Goldblum like, you know, is explaining chaos theory. Um, and so uh, I just, we, we want to make sure that any observed differences we see in the results, since the results are really what define the meaning of the survey, um, are not from the survey instrument itself. This goes back to this measurement bias question, like how can we isolate the effect that the survey has um, on the results that you get in the end? Um, <coughs> and so it turns out this is actually uh, related to some work in the causal inference literature um, called counterfactual estimation. Um, we didn't realize it at the time, it's super cool. Uh, and so there's a lot of interesting questions about this relationship that uh, you know, is worth looking into. So three observations. Um, first of all is that survey bank correctness, you know, neither the language nor the runtime system are causes of biases. This is the thing that we really want to be able to show. We you know, haven't formally proven it yet, but it's the goal that we have. Um, randomization marginalizes noise. This is, you know, uh, just taken as a truth of what randomiza uh, randomization does. And then if variation does exist um, and the population is not colluding with each other, um, then it's from one of the bugs or one of the biases that we mentioned way earlier on, which is not something we can control for. So um, I'm going to just skip ahead to my second to last slide and not go through the case study. Um, because this is the thing I really want you guys to think about. Um, the future of survey research and working with, uh, you know, social scientists. So this is Dr. House. He's famous for saying everybody lies. Um, so when it comes to these bad actors, um, is there a way to counteract them or does their satisfying behavior is just an arms race? Um, also, are there encodable abstractions for human behavior? We know that there's the first example here is, you know, how do we deal with, uh, actors who are intentionally behaving badly. But here, how do, we, how do we encode things that we know people do unintentionally? And finally, how do you, we are operating under a closed world assumption with our surveys. How do you incorporate prior knowledge about the world? How do you make sure that these things are generalizable? Um, and so are there programming language things that we can, uh, programming language concepts that we can apply to, to this problem? So, the end. Thank you. So that is the common way of handling it. Um, so the, the model that I showed earlier about gold standard questions is about that. How many of those do you need? For the case of um, providing labels, which is pretty constrained because you generally expect most people to agree on a certain number of labels, um, turns out it's like square root of the number of things that you need, which is really high. Um, coming up with these things and making sure that people don't recognize them is fairly expensive. So. And you can't reuse them after a while. People uh, figure out which ones are your like gold standard questions. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> 
So um, one of the things that yeah, so we would really like to be able to actually have um, like a higher level sort of constraint column essentially where you can say things like, you know, I expect if I ask some if I ask an entire population, you know, uh, whether or not you're an identical twin, I should expect, you know, 0.2% or something like that. It's something really low. And if I get higher than that, this says something about my population. Or things like so we actually do automatically compute correlations. So to use correlation information to say like, oh, hey, we know these two questions are correlated. Let's look into it and find a way of asserting that if you answer one way, with very high probability you answer another way in the rest of the survey. So uh, we are looking into it. Um, crafting those things intentionally and dealing with them in isolation um, is something that has are, is already done, um, that people actually do in practice, but is also, uh, like I said, somewhat expensive. So we can figure it out automatically. That would be amazing. And 